Hello and welcome ladies and gentlemen, my name is Remko Rinkema and you are watching Run It Back, the show in which we watch old school poker action most of the time. Sometimes we watch some new school action, which we did last week when Marley Cordero was on the show. We watched Poker After Dark that she featured on. And this week we're diving into the action featuring Jonathan Little and a whole bunch of players that were trying to turn his life at the table into pure misery because we are watching the sit and go that he featured on on Poker After Dark. We're going to go back to back episodes of Poker After Dark. So you're going to see the whole thing through from start to finish. This whole thing, we're going to break it down. I'm going to have some fun with it. We're going to do Q&A. So send in your questions into the chat. We are live on YouTube, on Twitch and on Facebook. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Do all that good stuff. I'm only going to say it a few times because we have a weekly show. I just want you guys to be there for it. Uh, but this week, I'm joined by John Little. He is not on the show for the first time, so he knows the format. Uh, John Jonathan, first and foremost, how, how, how are you doing and what have you been up to? I am doing great. I've been playing poker after dark, pretty much. That's about all I've been doing recently. So life is good. Life is good. I've been stuck in this, this little office. The office is about this big. It's, it's hot in here, so I'm wearing my, my gym clothes, you know. <laughs> I wrote a new book, Secrets of Professional Tournament Poker, The Essential Guide. So that's coming out soon. And this is a fun sit and go that we played. It was me and a bunch of coaches from my training site, pokercoaching.com. And um, I'm, I'm probably one of the worst players at the table. That's my, my, my job is to hire people better than me to create the best <laughs> poker content possible. And then I decided to go play poker with them. So uh, maybe I'm the fish. I mean, what, what do I always say? If you can't spot the fish at the table, you're probably it. Yeah, uh, that, that's that's pretty much what happened here. <laughs> uh, I mean, the honesty is very admirable. Uh, you mentioned the new book. Uh, I don't want to leave any opportunity unused to talk about stuff that you have going on in your life. Uh, question comes to mind. You've written books in the past. You've spent a lot of time uh, creating poker strategy content. What is different about this book? This book is actually a remake of my first three books I wrote 10 years ago. Back then, I roughly knew how to play, but I did not really know why I was playing in that particular way. But the advent of solvers over the last few years has essentially made it really clear why I was making a lot of the plays that were successful back then. And it's also good, too, to go see some of the exploits I was using back then that I was letting people know, like continuation bet the flop every time. Why? Because people overfold. Now your opponents aren't going to fold too often, so maybe you can't get away with continuation betting every time, right? <laughs> So it's a completely revamped, re, remade book. It took a, a lot of work, but I'm, I'm very, very happy with it. All right, Here's awesome. our sit and go here. This is six-handed, $5,000 buy-in, winner take all, I no re-entry. It has to be winner take all when it's on Poker After Dark. For those who are familiar with the first seven seasons, it was always <laughs> winner take all when it was a sit and go. Of course, there were some cash games mixed in, but I am always happy to watch sit and go format. I'm a tournament guy. When there's a cash game, I never feel the urgency. I always feel as though I can just walk out of the room. doesn't really matter that much. With a tournament, it's just a different vibe. I'm so excited that we get to watch this. And for the people in the chat, do send in your questions because we are indeed live taking your questions and whatever else you guys have going on. Uh, by the way, shout out to everyone who is already in the chat. Some of the regular viewers i appreciate you guys all tuning in um we got a lot to break down here because this is going to be from front to back this whole entire sit and go so um lots of hands to break down which we don't always do on the show but i think today is a good a good opportunity for that um jonathan when you say you're probably the worst player at the table how would you <laughs> how would you then classify these players like how do you look at these guys do they have specific skill sets are they you know are they good at one specific thing are are they just you know very smart people that always figure it out G give me a little bit of an introduction so we'll talk about it as we go through here this is justin sleba the tall tall guy in white um you may not know him he's been playing a lot of the super high roller tournaments high roller tournaments in vegas in miami basically wherever the big tournaments are in america he's been grinding them out he hasn't been especially lucky towards the end of them, so that's a bit of a bummer for him. But he um, makes very, very high-level content at PokerCoaching.com. His name on there is just GTO. So uh, <laughs> he is he knows everything about the solver. If I need any solver work done, I send it to Justin. He is uh, probably better at GTO poker than me. Um, his opponent in this hand, Faraz Jaka. Faraz Jaka is the exact opposite. He is, uh, you know, he, he, he can get in there and use the solver a little bit, but he is a super exploitative player. And we're going to see some of that today. So we have two very, very different styles sitting right next to each other, which is a lot of fun. And I kind of like to think of myself as someone who tries to blend all of these things, right? Like I'm a live poker player. If you're mostly a live poker player to some extent, you better know how to read people. But at the same time, if you're playing with a bunch of players who have clearly done an infinite amount of homework, you better know how to play good fundamentally sound poker too. 
and, and then and then let me just add to Faraz Jaka as well. Um, very disappointing that he's not wearing a colorful shirt, which he usually does. Um, also, one of the most interesting players to watch in big field tournaments. Very creative style, very unorthodox, uh, which makes him a lot of fun to watch. So if you ever catch a live stream with Faraz Jaka's name on it, you definitely should go and check it out. Um, let's move on to Brad Owen there. I see him there with the... By the way, did you guys coordinate on the outfits? It, it feels as though you guys were ready to go uh, out and party right after. We did go out and party right after. Oh, good. <laughs> so this is Brad Owen. He is a poker video blogger, plays a lot of cash games, mostly in Vegas. He also plays some tournaments. And um, he was the guest celebrity for the show because he's not a poker coach and coach, but he works with us a little bit. We do a lot of giveaways on his YouTube channel. I think it's youtube.com slash Brad Owen Poker. Does that sound right? Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, he has an incredibly popular video blog. And um, I'm probably better at tournaments than Brad is. He's a good cash game player. <laughs> Yeah, de definitely a cash game player from from looks of his vlogs. He was on a nice little heater there the last couple of months. I think he booked 22 uh, straight uh, winning sessions. I checked out some of his videos. You guys always should check out Brad Owen's vlog. Really a lot of fun Here's to watch. Brad trying to bluff me. That's I can already tell you, I'm not folding the top pair. I don't care what river card comes. He's going to get paid if he gets there. And, and, and stacks Whatever. are deep in the beginning too, which which probably makes him feel comfortable be, having the cash, ca cash game background. I will say, I think Brad realized he was uh, probably a little bit out of his element here because he's playing against a lot of like very, very good poker players. I mean, if I had to guess, everybody else is probably like in the top, I don't know, 500 or 1,000 poker player, tournament players in the world, right? And Brad plays mostly cash games. So he came here to gamble with us, and that is A-OK. -okay. Yeah, definitely. And then uh, Matt Affleck, uh, maybe for outsiders, the most famous name in this lineup, if you only watch poker on TV. He, of course, um, in my opinion, part of the most heartbreak in, in, in WSB main event history. Oh, we got, we got a, we got a fan. We, we got a fan. We got a guest. What can I do for you? Say hello. No, no, you can't listen right now. What's up? We're, we're working from home today. It's COVID I, time. I love this it. Is James, can you say hello? That's Rimco. Hi, James. Hello. Hey, speak English. Speak English. Uh, Hi, James. Hello. How are you? Hello. Do you like Do you like uh, poker, James? Yeah. <laughs> you like poker? Yeah. He yeah. Loves poker. Awesome. I love it. It's good to have James on the show. Hey, That's my friend. Yeah, these are all my friends. Hello. Yeah. We were playing poker together. You see? I am Mike. All right, go go play with your friends. I'll see you I later. Am Mike. You're Mike? Mike. No, your name is James. Mike. All right. Mike. I need you to go. <laughs> See you later. Have a good day. I love I love the cameo by James there. You, you can tell he's already trying to get into the G GTO streets and, and and figure out what the the proper approach is to a sit and go play. The other day I was sitting here and playing online poker, and he came and banged on the door and looked right at me and said, "You're gonna lose." <laughs> oh my God! Did you? No, I actually won. Oh, <laughs> so I need that to happen way more often. Here we have a four bet pot. Look at this hand. This hand is ridiculous. Okay, I believe. Brad raises Justin three bets on the button when I need suited. Let's Brad go, four bets. Let's go back. The Ace King. We we do we have we have a time machine here uh, on call. Wow. So um, let's just go into the run time it back. Machine. Right? Yeah, run it back. There we go. All right, take it from the top. Okay, Brad Owen, Ace King, five hundred big blind. He's gonna make it fifteen hundred, I think. Justin on the button, nine eight suited. You can call. You can three bet. You can do whatever you want. I often call, but three betting is fine too. Back around to Brad. We are playing 100,000 chips deep, okay? So 200 big blinds. Right. While this is a sit and go, it is winner take all. So that means it's effectively going to play like a cash game because there are no pound implications, right? So there's no value in or no merit in. I want to call to make sure I don't go broke in this hand or anything like that. It is worth noting. Again, I mentioned Brad's not the tournament player in this group. If you actually think you're ever playing at a disadvantage, you should actually be like really pushing any edge you can because let's say you're a little bit ahead, that might be the best spot you find. Again, I'm not saying that's necessarily the case for Brad, but you should definitely be four betting here. And that's what he does. Justin has to see the flop in position and uh, looks like Brad might be out on the first hand of the tournament pretty much. <laughs> wow. So, so let me ask you the call in position from, from uh, Mr. Tall and handsome there in the, in the right corner. Um, is, is that fairly standard to call a four, bet uh, when the stacks are this deep? For sure. Any hand that can flop well in a heads-up pot, you just have to call and try to flop well. But at, what's the cutoff point for big blinds? Because it's easy to extrapolate what you just said and apply it to the wrong stack size. Sure. Uh, so look, he's in position, so that's going to make you want to call a lot. He's closing the action. He's going to call a lot. I think it went uh, 1,500, 4,500, 14,000. So it was even kind of big. 
Um, but I mean, you need to realize 30% equity in position with nine, eight suited. It's kind of hard not to do unless Brad's just the weakest, tightest poker player in the world, which he's not. So unless you know your games like aces, kings, and queens, you just, you got to call and try to flop something because usually just one pair is good. Right. So in this case, uh, Brad bets 10K into uh, 29 five and then uh, Vincent um, raises it up to, or sorry, Justin, Justin, Justin. Justin. Justin raises it up to a 30K here. Um, how do you feel about the way this hand plays on the flop? Given Brad bets so small, I think you should probably raise an eight because it's very likely the best hand, but it's vulnerable to being outdrawn. Um, if Brad bet bigger, like say Brad bet 20K, maybe you just call because then you're not so concerned with like protecting your equity. So I, I like I like the way Justin raised it. I think if I was in Brad's shoes, I probably just would have bet bigger because you almost always have the best hand. I mean, here he doesn't, but whenever you do have the best hand, you just want to get money in the pot. And right here, you're also somewhat vulnerable to being outdrawn. Like when you bet 10,000 here, you can easily call with queen jack of hearts and just try to get a, a gut shot or backdoor flush, right? Right. All right. So Brad checks the turn, which is also interesting. I'm sorry, he he got raised on the block. Yeah. 10,000 raised to 30 and then call. So yeah, you got to check the turn. Justin's going for just straight up value. Almost certainly has the best hand. Pot was eight, uh, 90, and 90 and he bet 40. So medium bet size here. Trying to set up stacks to get it all in by the river. Yeah, so Justin my- talks a lot about bet sizing in his videos of poker coaching about how you want to bet an amount that like puts your opponent in kind of miserable spots on both the turn and the river with your entire range. Yeah. So what, what I'm wondering here on this, on this turn, when he bets 40 K is how does Brad interpret the range that Justin has here? Because that of course is a decision that will go into how he plays the river, even though we're only on the, on the turn. I mean, it, it's hard to know. I mean, Justin's name is just GTO. I'm going to presume he has the adequate amount of bluffs. So what are some hands that you may want to bluff? Raise the small flop bet. The thing is, you probably want to call with the good draws, like open into straight draws. So you probably want to raise the weaker draws. Like, I don't even know, queen jack, queen 10 maybe. But anyway, there, Brad just folds the ace king. Sicko play. Justin's clearly the fish. I mean, is that a play where it's okay to go broke? I probably would have just checked call turn and check called on safe rivers and, and lost. <laughs> right. Right. I don't think Brad wanted to come onto the show and lose on the third hand of the day though. That probably wasn't his strategy. Yeah. But it, it is sort of fascinating because ACE King, you know, top hair on, on a board that looks relatively safe. Uh, there's only a few combinations that, that really smash you. Um, you know, King eight, King nine, King four, and definitely not in this range. You know, you're thinking of eights and nines, um, you know, not even fours. Uh, maybe you're up against other ace kings. Um, aces might be in the range, but that's sort of it. That's it. <laughs> not a lot. So uh, would you would you say, we, we've seen the cards, would you say good fold by Brad, or is he supposed to lose more there um, if we look at the ranges? I think he's probably supposed to just lose all his money. That's just a, like a terrible setup. Right. And, and when you get in a terrible setup, you're probably just going to lose. And if you're folding ace-king there, you're folding basically everything. That said, maybe he had some read that Justin didn't want to go broke on the third hand. Maybe nobody wants to go broke on the third hand. You fly out to Vegas or you come and you pony up 5,000 bucks. You're going to be on Poker Go, on Poker After Dark. You really want to go broke on the third hand. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a very good point. Uh, James Romero, by the way, the only player that we haven't discussed yet, also very, very accomplished, has uh, almost $5 million in career tournament earnings. A large chunk of that came in the WT5 Diamond that he won back in 2016. Uh, so clearly very accomplished as well. You guys are getting in the mix right now. You have Ace King with the King of Diamonds here on the turn uh, against uh, you know two, the sevens of Romero that are currently still ahead, um, but not a lot of money uh, going in the pot right now. Um, yeah, this is a tough spot where it's really easy for Romero to have some sort of a pair. I'm not really going to try to bluff him off of. It's really easy for Affleck to have some sort of pair. I'm not going to try to bluff him off of. And if they happen to have garbage, I win. So no reason to bet the ace king in this spot, I don't think. I mean, maybe I could bluff it on the turn if I felt inclined. Interestingly enough, Affleck, with pretty much the nut low, decides to bluff the river. You got to watch Affleck too. Affleck makes in-depth webinars every single week for Poker Coach and Premium members. And they're like really in-depth. Like I go through and I watch all of them. I learn a ton. Um, he basically asks the students, what spots are giving you trouble? And we will go through and really thoroughly analyze that spot. So you don't have to worry about that spot anymore. And um, he, he did a series recently on playing multi-way pots. But Romero calls. Course, <laughs> Romero has a pair. Like I said, don't try to make good players fold a pair. Um, but like right here is a spot where I, I literally never would have bluffed the 5-4, but I bet it's good. 
Because, like, I mean, you got to find some bluffs, right? I mean, the, the, it's a spot where you probably just want to take whatever low showdown value hands you have and bluff them some portion of the time. Um, James Romero, for those who do not know, I think he may be, like, one of the top 10 poker players in the world in the form of tournaments. Super crusher. Super genius. I've learned uh, a huge amount from just, just talking to him the little bit that I have. Wow. That, Absolute crusher. That, I mean, before COVID happened, he was, I think, in the top 10 in – the GPI for, for live tournament players. And like he plays, he was playing mostly online. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, it's interesting to see these players who are just like crushing both venues, no problem. And um, I've learned a lot from him. That's, that's, I try to hire people that I want to learn from. <laughs> that, that is always fascinating when, you know, 5 million in earnings doesn't really raise a lot of eyebrows. A lot of players have that these days. So to hear from you that this player is, is someone that we should really look at uh, is also helpful for future streams as Life Poker is, is coming back hot and heavy, especially in Las Vegas. I think that uh, we are on the, on the, uh, on the brink of basically 200 days straight of high stakes action in Vegas between US Poker Open, Poker Go Cup, the Win Series. Um, we got Poker Masters straight into WSOP, and then there's going to be some World Poker Tours mixed in. So we're going to probably see James Romero uh, and, and, and Matt Affleck in particular a lot in some of these bigger buy-in events. So it's good to know that uh, he is definitely one to keep an eye on. Um, I'm seeing yeah. lots of questions come in, by the way, in the chat. I do appreciate it. We'll try to get to those uh, as soon as we Hello, can. Hello, chat. Yeah, exactly. I'll be at US Poker Open. Come find me and you can ask me all of your questions. Are you coming out for US Poker Open? Yeah. Oh my God, I love like it. Like you said, it's high stakes gambling time, man. Uh, do you have a lot of pent up gambling energy? Yes. <laughs> I love it. That is incredible. Uh, US Poker Open, by the way, starting next week on Friday. It's going to be, uh, I believe, 10 straight days of live streaming um, on Poker Go. We're going to do some free preview stuff on YouTube. So if you just want to get a little taste, go check that out. We're going to have streams every single day. We're going to have uh, lots of 10K buy-ins and then closing it out with a 25 and a 50K. Uh, and also there's a giant eagle trophy for the overall uh, champion. And Jonathan, I kid you not, this thing weighs 54 pounds. All right, great. I'll try to win it. You think it'll fit right there on the bookshelf somewhere in, in that vicinity? You might have to too big? you might have to reinforce the bookshelf. But yes. We have to go I have to go up on top. We gotta to go on top oh, of the bookshelf. It, yeah. A little bit of room at the top. You need like an eagle eagle cam to go to when you're on your on your webinar. So people can <laughs> I could hang it from the ceiling above my head like a chandelier if I really wanted to gamble. <laughs> that would be amazing. Uh yeah. 54 pound chandelier. <laughs> for for everyone interested, please keep checking out uh, the Poker Central live reporting page uh all throughout the, that series and then we'll have live streams of course every single day as well. Um the, the questions in the chat, that's what I was going to say. We're going to get to those uh in our Q&A section later in the show, uh, but first Look at got, this. We Brad, got... Brad uh, Owen set up again by Justin. There it is. Brutal. So, so I just want to paint a picture here. Brad comes here. People think he's probably not a great tournament player and, and ter compared to everybody else, right? Nothing against him, just everybody else is really, really good. And now he's just getting three bet left and right. <laughs> For, all right first hand, Justin three bets him with a nine, eight suited. He four bets, he still loses the pot. He opens ace jack, Justin three bets again, and he just folds the ace jack like a hero correctly again. So Justin's had him set up twice and he's correctly folded to him both times. Good job, good work, Brad. Exactly. I would have been broke twice if I was in Brad's shoes, probably. Yeah, I, I feel I feel as though it's it's really tough to to not go broke when you play six handed against good players and you 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 constantly have to remind yourself: Are they are we just leveling each other here? Is is are we getting serious right off the bat? Especially in the early early goings when the stacks are so deep, uh, that is definitely a huge factor. By the way, you guys all seem super relaxed. You guys all seem friendly, which definitely adds to the atmosphere, which made this also uh, a lot of fun to watch. For those who just want to watch this Poker After Dark episode without our blabbering over it, you can do so on PokerGo.com right now. All this stuff is available on demand, and also. Also, I just want to mention this. You see on screen here, for the people that are watching this, right on this side, it's mirrored, so it's hard for me. Um, subscribe to our new channel. It's called Run and Back Clips. There's a link in the description. Uh, go check it out. We release three clips a week from the Run and Back shows. And that means that you get a little bit of extra insight uh, of, of all the greatest stories that I've had on the show. I've done over 100 episodes of Running Back because we started this when the pandemic first broke loose and we've been continuing to do so. And we're going to put all our highlights up on that channel. So go subscribe to the Running Back Clips channel. The, among the first 500 subscribers of that channel, we are giving away some signed photos by Phil Helmuth and Daniel Negreanu from the High Stakes Duel Match and also some signed decks of cards. So don't miss out. Go subscribe to that channel right now. We are on our way to the first 500. We'll hopefully hit, hit that by next week week and then we'll do a draw and let you guys know on this very show 
who is going to get the signed merch. Um, all right, I just good saw... luck. Click like, click subscribe, <laughs> click the notification bell. Let's do it. Oh. Want, we, we breeze through this hand, but Brad opened aces, Faraz Jock a three bet, the three two off suit, <laughs> the very next hand. So, so far, Brad's been three bet like three or four times, and uh, he four bet the aces and Faraz folded. Okay, so I'm setting up this dynamic because I know how this plays out. <laughs> spoiler alert there's spoiler gonna, alert i was there there's going to be some all-ins and 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 jonathan was there indeed um shout out to everyone in the chat i do appreciate everyone tuning in we got so many people watching don't forget to hit the like button that is much appreciated all right here we got uh, action folded around to justin and he raises it up with the nine seven suited jonathan is a nit he folds the button which you never should you should never fold the button that's not not a good thing to do no, it's a little bit unfortunate, actually. I, di I didn't really get many cards. I actually played another episode of Poker After Dark right before this one, and I just was like on the bad end of two coolers and just kind of lost. Like, in my mind, everybody would have lost in that spot unless you're Brad Owen and make a hero fold. I don't make hero folds. And then at this table, I really didn't get many very good cards either. And when it happens, you just like kind of sit there, and it's kind of a bummer. But you got to realize, I probably played, what, 300 hands over the course of two days? It's like not a lot of poker, right? So it's a bit of a bummer when that happens. And you see... Brad getting ace king aces ace jack is like come on <laughs> yeah and, and but that's okay that's okay such as poker such as life i have a youtube channel too people can check it out youtube.com slash poker coaching we upload lots and lots of strategy content there some stuff by matt affleck there stuff by stuff with brad owen there lots and lots of good content there if you want to check it out at youtube.com slash poker coaching so here justin raises justin continuation bets affleck has this junky draw Backdoor flush draw, over card, backdoor straight draw. I can guarantee Affleck's going to check raise this one pretty much every time. I've studied his training videos. He does check raise. He does pick up the pot. Strong play. Yeah, so the, for, for someone at my level or for someone uh, who is maybe better than I am that, are, that is watching right now, why is it such a good spot to check raise? Explain that in, in, uh, the, in layman's terms. Here you want to check raise with three different kinds of hands in general. You want to check raise your best hands that you're happy playing for a lot of money maybe ace jack and better maybe king jack and better which you don't have a ton of but he did defend the big blind so he has jack five suited jack three suited he has a lot of hands here he has probably has all the five threes maybe okay so you want to check raise those you also want to check raise with your premium draws that are happy playing for a lot of money maybe like king queen of clubs maybe ace four of clubs ace six of clubs stuff like that then you also want to check raise some really junky draws that if you check raise them and then get re-raised you can easily fold but these draws need to have some additional equity because you don't really want to check raise like eight, seven of clubs. Because if you get check raise and you have eight, or you don't want to check raise eight, seven of clubs because if you get re raise, it's really bad. And even if you get called, you could still be super dominated by a better flush draw, right? So you want to make sure your draws are either really, really good or are not quite good enough to call, like this king high, right? But have additional equity. And notice here, there are a ton of good turn cards for him. King is good, seven's good, four is good, diamond's good right? All these cards give him additional equity they can keep betting on. And that way, Justin is not going to know if he has a really good hand, like a set or two pair or ace jack, or if he has a good draw that he's not folding or some junk. And that's going to make you really, really difficult to play against if you mix in a lot of check raises with stuff like backdoor flush draws or gut shot straight draws, stuff like that. That's not quite good enough to call. So we're check raising with the intention to continue on all cards that are good for us and all the cards that are bad for us, we sort of shut down. Uh, sometimes. But, but notice, the thing is, is like, say a club comes, you could reasonably continue bluffing because you have a lot of clubs in your range, right? Because right. you would check raise with some flush draws that, that would have gotten there. And when it comes to blank, you sometimes get to keep betting because you would have played ace jack and sets the same way, right? So it puts your opponent in a really nasty spot. And you get to have a lot of bluffs on the flop. Sometimes as many as like two times as many value hands that you have. A lot of people don't realize you get to bluff a ton on the flop because some of those bluffs are going to turn into decent hands by the river. All right, so Faraz Jocker raises it up with kings. It's always good to get kings. So remember how we mentioned like Justin, just GTO, probably plays very close to GTO. Then we have Faraz Jocka, who is the exact opposite, right? They get in there and they battle. I think Matt Affleck plays kind of similar to Justin, like kind of GTO type player. Um, James Romero will just get in there and battle hard. Super exploitative player. So remember, so far, everyone's been trying to outplay Brad Owen in his mind. He's been three-bet every hand. Now this happens. He has the top two pair against Faraz Jock, exactly where he want to be. But Faraz has a top set. <laughs> that's not so good for him. But maybe Brad gets a card on the turn that's going to save him, turns an ace. Faraz decided to check back the flop, which is certainly fine. Whenever you have the super nuts like this, it's fine to check it back. But as an exploit, I just usually bet it because people don't fold pairs. 
And if you bet it, sometimes you run into the king seven and you just stack him for sure. Yeah, but every once in a while, whenever you're in this kind of setup spot, it'll come off like a five and then an eight or something like that. Then you don't stack him. But it, it, it's so. checking behind is by the way, that comes Brad Owen with the check raise, um, which of course is is a great card to check raise unless your opponent has top set or a set of kings. Um, is one of the is one of the thoughts that Faraz has to check behind there is that he'll never get three streets of value, so he's trying to get two streets of value and do it on a turn of river. Yeah, and also you induce bluffs sometimes. Like say Brad's sitting here with whatever, nothing, and then he'll just bet the turn and bet the river because he's going to think Faraz perhaps has a lot of weak kings and worse. It's very nice to check back with some premium hands. So anyway, uh, Brad decided to check raise the turn, which is probably fine. And now he's blasting this river. And Faraz has decided if he should go for value or not. He goes 23K, so kind of, uh, what, 30, or four, sorry, 70% uh, pot. And it's actually a kind of interesting spot because some backdoor draws come in. Or some gut shot draws come in. But whatever, I would just always go all in here. Yeah. Especially given the way people have been kind of aggressive so far. And, you know, Faraz Jockey gets paid off a lot because he's in there battling, right? If you're in there battling hard, you should go for... I mean, this isn't even thin value, but you should probably raise any set here because any set's almost certainly good. Um, should he raise ace king? It's probably close. Like, I think it's probably right on the border of what you can get away with raising for value. So you'd say shoving, considering the stack size, is probably the, the right approach instead of what <laughs> Faraz does where he just basically, you know, raises to a size that Brad can still call and be in the tournament? Yeah. I, I'm not... I'm So look... Among recreational players, they really want to stay in the tournament, right? So against recreational players, I'm a pretty big fan of not stacking them and just leaving them some change because then they're not out. But I don't think that's Brad. Like, Brad realizes if I have a good hand and I'm against Faraz Jaka, who likes to bluff sometimes, I just cannot fold anything. <laughs> so just like that, Brad has gotten absolutely demolished, despite the fact that he's actually played really, really well. He just ran into it, right? When he does get raised on that river, I think it's actually close. Like, if he was against a more conservative player i think it's a reasonable spot to fold but i would never fold to Faraz jaka there question coming in on twitch from uh, cyrus he says i'm a little cu curious how much smack talk was there at the table mm, not a lot we're actually all kind of friendly we are not the uh smack talking poker celebrities we are the let's try to help everyone improve their skills and enjoy their life more celebrities <laughs> so uh there was not much smack talk really I asked James Romero who he thought was going to win in a in my video blog before this, and he said me, of course. So that was that was the extent of the smack talk. Um, I made a video blog about this. You can find it on my YouTube channel at youtube.com/pokercoaching, where I go through, show you behind the scenes. It's a lot of fun. Very good, very good stuff. Um, yes, yeah, Cyrus, uh, John Little, and all his friends came in holding hands, singing "Kumbaya." It was very friendly. They did not want to. They, they did not want to beat each other. They were all trying to lose. And they lived happily ever, ever after. Yeah. Um, that question coming in uh, on YouTube that I saw earlier from uh, Rishal, he says, how to better manage your bankroll? Any guides on that? Yes, go to pokercoaching.com slash bankroll. I get this question about eh, seven times per day. So I wrote a giant bankroll Bible there for you. All right, here's Brad Owen's setup again. Maybe. Faraz Jaka has the flush draw. Brad has the top pair, top kicker. Brad's had all the good hands. Are you, are you paying attention <laughs> to this? He's had all the hands for the entire table. This is unbelievable. I mean, I, I could make a compilation of, of, of Brad Owen just getting demolished. Uh, <laughs> it's pretty bizarre. Through no fault of his own, too. That's the tough part here, right? So he, here he bets the turn. I think you should probably go bigger on the turn here because you want to try to extract value from draw slash worse made hands. And there's a lot of them here, right? There's this idea of like range connectivity. How well does the opponent's range connect with the board in terms of like obviously good hands? And right here, there's queen 10, that's obviously good. There's a king, king, queen, king, you know, all the kings, those are obviously good. Um, Ace, jack, queen, jack, those are all obviously good. He goes for value on the river, I mean, it's fine to shop. Frost has nothing, so he has to fold. But hey, he didn't get set up that time. Big winner. Brad Owen. That's the worst whenever you uh, lose every hand and then, then you get a double up for your 10 big blinds or whatever. They're like, oh, congrats, congrats. It's like, get out of here. Brad Owen finally wins a hand on Poker After Dark. For those that are just tuning in, we are watching the Poker After Dark sit and go that John Little and his friends uh, slash partner or slash coaches at PokerCoaching.com were playing on. It's a $5,000 sit and go played in Las Vegas at the PokerGo studio. If you have not watched the action yet, you can check all this stuff out on PokerGo. All the content that is on Run It Back is available on 
on Poker Go. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to our new channel called Running Back Clips. You can find the link in the description. That is the place to be if you want to just get little short bites of action from the over 100 shows that I've done in this very format. We watch some old high stakes poker. We watch some old WSOP stuff. We've basically done it all on Running Back. And Jonathan is on the show for the second time because we had more stuff to break down from the WSOP earlier. The the, the famous, uh, I think it was Ryan DePaulo final table that we went through. Uh, and now we're breaking down the action that he was involved in so he can, he can critique his own play. I'm very curious if he's ever going to play a hand. So far, no. I raised Ace King and I checked it out and I missed. So far, I'm, I'm playing, playing lights out. Great. <laughs> All right. Here we have Justin raising it up. James Romero. I'm sorry. James Romero. What's happening? This is backwards. Oh, no, it's not backward. Okay, yeah, Justin raised it up with the 8-5 suited. James Romero with three bets, the big blind 8s, 10 suited, which is perfectly fine and standard. If any of, um, this is confusing to you, I have charts at pokercoaching.com, GTO preflop charts. I can guarantee you both of this, both of these are solver approved. Should Justin have called the three bet? Probably not. That's a little bit loose. <laughs> <laughs> Justin's flashing a bit. And then, and then Romero with the initiative here. Uh, is this the type of flop that you're looking to continue on? I mean, yeah, I guess. This is essentially one of these bad bluffs, right? This is a hand that you can reasonably bet and then just fold if you get raised. Because um, like we talked about before, you want to be betting your best hands, your premium draws, and your kind of junky draws. And like right here, if you get an ace, it's probably good. Sometimes if you get a 10, an, a ten it's good. Um, and if your opponent folds, that's great too, right? Like if you get queen jack to fold, it's fine. He goes for the small bet, as he probably wants to do just pretty frequently on this board in general. Because... Presumably, Justin Saliba does not have aces and ace-king and kings, right? Ten of hearts on the turn, so they both have everything. Well, Romero has a pair, so that's basically the nuts. And Saliba has all the draws. Yeah, this is Did you pause this on me? Yeah, I pause it on you. This is an interesting spot because it, it always makes me curious because the one player adds showdown value. The other player... Uh, makes their draw that much stronger so from both sides this is a great card however the way this hand can now be played also really really changes because of all the added options that are that are being thrown out there right now from Romero's perspective um, are you confident to continue betting or is this the kind of card where you're like okay let's shut it down and get the showdown I would definitely check this I don't know what Romero is going to do but this seems like a really really clear marginal made hand if you bet and get called it's not great if you um, check, you can easily check call. And I think uh, Saliba should probably go for a bet. I mean, it, it's tough. You want to make sure you don't bet an amount that will result in you getting check raised all in or check raised any amount here. So this is a spot where I would bet in Justin's shoes. It's, it's kind of a tough spot, but I mean, what are you going to do? If you're against Romero's hands like ace jack and ace queen, those are hands that you could bet turn and conceivably get called. And then you could barrel it on the river. So if I do bet turn here, I'm definitely betting on like every river pretty much. Meanwhile, we notice have they had this uh, side cam here where Faraz is talking about what's going on. So that was a lot of fun. Make sure you check that out on Poker Go. This is called Lessons Learned. If you want to search Poker After Dark Lessons Learned, it'll come right up. Uh, I think it went check, check, though. I don't know why Justin checked here. It, Maybe he thought he was going to get check raised sometimes. It did go check, check. And James uh, Romero is super, super strong GTO tournament player, too. So he's he knows how to put in the check raises. If your opponent knows how to check raise, you got to be a little bit more cautious betting draws like this 8-5 suited that cannot bet and then call right because right here it'd be so bad to get check raised so i mean it goes back to that idea again right you want to be betting your draws that can easily continue and your draws that cannot continue now romero goes for value on the river i think value from <laughs> value from what that's kind of it's kind he's of trying a... to essentially make it look like he has some sort of busted draw here hoping that a 10 calls hoping that a six calls hoping that an under pair calls i'm not sure about this bet i'm going to just presume romero knows what he's doing i never would have made this bet here Maybe he's bluffing. I don't know. I mean, I would be shocked if Justin ever folds a king. Yeah, this hand was very sort of curious to me because it feels as though Romero's short on value is so strong that giving um, his opponent the chance to bluff, uh, you know, from my my sort of <laughs> mediocre level brain, uh, seems like um, a much safer play to extract some value. We can share the clip with James Romero on Twitter and ask him why. He'll tell us. We should. James, let us know. Uh, no, you have to share with him. He, he's, not, he's not watching right this second, probably. No, but we will send this clip to him, and then he has to okay. tell us. So I'm telling him right now. If you see, if you see this, let us know what the uh, thought process was on the river here. So now, I remember I was talking to Justin about this afterwards. He's like, yeah, I was going to consider shoving it all in, but then I, I, uh, I kind of got scared and put my chips in all funny. <laughs> 
I don't think Justin's played a ton on TV. He's, he's a young guy, right? He, he thought for forever, tanked, and then put in this weird, I guess it's a pretty big race. It's, uh, to, you got the eight high on the river. You got a bluff. That is a crazy hand, by the way, the way this is playing out. Because on the one hand, when I first saw Romero, but I'm like, whoa, that's really strange and big. And then you see Saliba, like, oh, it's easy fold. And then he just puts in the big raise uh, and Romero calls it off. <laughs> so in this scenario, if I was in Romero's shoes, I would have just checked the river and check called and won like 20K. Instead, Romero bets 45, gets raised to 100 and change, and then calls and he wins all the chips. So uh, this is why, you know, Romero is literally the best poker player. And I'm like, I, I don't fault Justin for his raise at all. I kind of like it. Yeah, I do. I, I like, of all the options that were or used on the river, I like his raise the best. Well, he could have folded too. Fold's an option. Right. No, no, I'm saying of what, <laughs> of what we saw. Of Romero's sure. bet, the raise and the call, I like the raise the best. Uh, Saliba, meanwhile, down to only 58K, still has more chips than Brad Owen, who's been get, getting pummeled so far. And we have Faraz and uh, James at the top of the leaderboard. Uh, if you're just tuning in, this is Run It Back. We are watching Poker After Dark ha action. It only aired on Poker Go just very recently. This is all new content, ladies and gentlemen. Go check it out on Poker Go. We have a new season of Poker After Dark out. We also have a new season out of High Stakes Poker featuring uh, Tom Luan, Rick Solomon, JRB, who's getting crushed, which is always fun to watch. He's drinking wine and being frustrated. Bren Kenny's in the mix. Nick Petrangelo. Uh, go and check that out. Um, if we have any questions, please send them into the chat. By the way, Noise Sauce comes in with a really hot comment. He says, the only white magic Jonathan is... Oh, the only magic Jonathan is used to is Magic the Gathering. That is that is somewhat funny. Um, I, I appreciate that. Um, let's see what else we got here. Um, I like Magic the Gathering. Yeah, I, I know, I know. And um, Love to Trade says, does Jonathan study GTO religiously or does he rely on his white magic? Um, I study what Matt Affleck tells me because he is a GTO master and I study what just GTO tells me because he's a GTO master. I study what uh, James Romero sends me. He's a GTO master. There's a lot of value in finding people who actually do religiously study this stuff and have them consolidate everything good and useful to you and then just send it to you. And I'm very fortunate to be in that spot. And then we take that and turn around and give it to all of you on pokercoaching.com. So no, I don't sit here running solvers all day, but I uh, talk to people very regularly who do, and they send me content about everything they're learning, right? right. Basically they consolidate all the information and it saves me a ton of time and effort and make good use of our time. All right, what in the world's happened in this hand? So here, it must have been limp check. He must, I don't know what's happening here. You're, you're trying to play a small pot. Um, I'm trying to play a small pot with a nine high, great. And, <laughs> and Justin has a flush, great. <laughs> Sounds about right. I told him I didn't win any hands. <laughs> yeah. He has a flush, uh, small pot, small stack size. So, and also, I don't know. I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't see you bluffing here on this uh on this board given the passive action leading up to this point you know i will say though you actually should bluff in spots like this a lot like say it goes limp check 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 on the river to you you should be betting like all of your no show a lot of your no showdown value hands maybe not all but certainly a lot because your opponent's gonna be sitting over there like queen high or 10 high right it is a disaster whenever you do not get 10 high to fold when you're sitting there with nine high right right, right. That's a very good point. So more bluffing. That's 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 yeah, the advice. Yeah, I mean, you have to think. Like, I would have bluffed with my draws on the flop or draw e type hands on the flop, so I don't have those anymore. I would have checked behind with my like decently strong marginal hand on the turn, hoping to just call a river bet. I get to the river, I would definitely value bet with some hands. If you're gonna value bet with some hands, then if you're trying to play a fundamentally sound strategy, you should also bluff sometimes. Shout out to uh, Pat Maxwell on Facebook, who just sent 500 stars. Pat, I don't even know what that means, 500 stars, but it sounds incredible. And thank you so much. I really appreciate it. That is an awesome donation to the channel. I do appreciate it. A question from Ender on uh, Twitch. He says, when will season nine of High Stakes Poker be released? Brent Hanks, as we speak, is on many, many calls with all these top level players to get the taping of season nine underway. Uh, I believe we are taping somewhere in late July for High Stakes Poker season nine. So somewhere in the fall uh, or late summer, we'll be releasing another new season of High Stakes Poker. And until then, we'll keep you guys occupied with lots of uh, Poker After Dark episodes that are coming out weekly. And also, of course, lots of tournament action as the US Poker Open starts on Friday next week, a week from today, or sorry, eight days from today. Jonathan Little is going to be in town along with probably the entire poker world because uh, high stakes uh, tournaments are back 
and uh, it's going to be very exciting to see what is going to happen. All right, here we have some hands. This is going to be a, this is going to be action. All right, so let's take a look at this. In this scenario, uh, Justin Sleeper raised early position. I folded King Jack offsuit. Justin raised under the gun. I folded King Jack offsuit, which is fine. Um, Romero calls with pocket nines, which is fine. He could re-raise, but I would always call there. Brad Owen calls small blind King eight suited, which is fine. Now for Oz, pocket jacks in the big blind, bumps it up, which I also think is fine. Justin gets out of the way. This was a fun hand because I don't know when slash how it happened, but Romero showed me his cards for a sweat, for fun. <laughs> so I know what Romero has this entire time. I think he was um, he was sad for me because I didn't really get to play any hands. So <laughs> he was like, here, I mean, you can play my hand. <laughs> I'm getting some cards. You're not getting any cards. To be fair, I had the King Jack. I could have played it, right? Good thing I didn't. So anyway, Romero calls Brad Folds. We're going to see a flop. We are playing very deep stack. This is like first and second in chips here. So does so it later. does it severely cap Romero's range by playing the call call before the flop? I mean, he probably doesn't have aces and kings, but he certainly could have maybe queens, definitely tens, right? He could easily have like ace queen suited stuff like that. You got to realize he's he's basically closing the action in position, getting pot odds. So like it's okay to be capped in spots like this because the hands he's going to have are going to be like pretty decent, right? Like he's not going to call with nine seven offsuit or something. And um, while Faraz does have all the best hands, he also has some amount of bluffs. And if he has some amount of bluffs, then it's e even though Faraz is going to have more effective nut hands a lot of the time, he's also going to have a lot of garbage sometimes too. So it's not like this is a spot where Romero is just in terrible shape. Anyway, Faraz bets the flop. Romero calls. Seems nice and fine. Huge pot developing, by the way, compared to the other players at the table. There's a, there's a lot in the middle here. Um, basically playing for stacks from from Jaka's point, right? At this point. Yeah, yeah, we're getting close. He has 150k behind with 122 in the pot. The five is a kind of nasty term because now various ace highs pick up some equity. And and you know Romero may call a three bet like ace x suited for sure. Like I think that's reasonable. So now. Faraz goes 50K, leaving 100K behind, which is an interesting scenario. Problem is he's giving Romero like pretty good odds. The thing is, though, is I think Romero's going to have a lot of 10s here. And he's also going to have a lot of underpairs here. And you don't really care if those stay in the pot to some extent. Obviously, you're going to get outdrawn on some rivers. I think a lot of people are probably looking at this and saying, why wouldn't he just go all in on the turn? Because he only had 1.3x pot. But the thing is, is that if you shove, then what's going to call you? Like only a 10 or better? And you are going to be against some better hands here. Like ace three is definitely in Romero's range, like ace three suited. Probably ace three. Well, all the ace three suited are going to be in this range because he would float the flop there, I got to presume. Um, he probably doesn't have five, four. Could have pocket tens, right? I don't think he has queens all that often. So this is a spot where Jaka does have the best hand almost every time. But if he just rips it all in, a lot of those hands he wants to get action from that are drawing pretty thin will just fold. Is, is, so anyway, Romero calls. Yeah, but does this have to do with Jaka's bet sizing on the flop? Of course, we're going to see the river card here, so I'm just going to pause it for a second. Um, it kind of got a little bit... It, this got weird because there was a very big pot pre-flop compared to normal because it went raise, call, 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 three bet, right. fold, call, right? So the pot was already quite big. Uh, maybe Frost could have sized it a little bit differently on the flop or something to set up slightly nicer post-flop bet sizes. Yeah, because anyway, we, here we are on the river. River's yeah. like the, the nut low river. We got the three, right? <laughs> so now Faraz loses to every ace X suited. Even like ace queen if it decided to float the turn for fun. Not that I think that's going to happen, but he could have like ace queen of spades. So Jaka checks the river. I'm sitting here on the sideline and I, I know that Romero has these nines and he's about to bluff it. So do you bluff the nines? That's the question. I mean, in this spot, you got to presume Faraz has some aces, which he's obviously going to call. But then also a lot of pairs, like kings, queens, jacks. Maybe he has like ace, well, maybe not ace 10, that's going to call you. Maybe he has like king 10 suited sometimes, king 10 offsuit sometimes, who knows. Um, so in this scenario, 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 in this scenario, Romero goes for the bluff. He basically, he puts Faraz all in. <laughs> Fun scenario, right? Yeah, and but it, but it's also... In a way, this is also like opponent dependent. I feel like you know Faraz and, and Romero, not really sure what their dynamics are. But from Faraz's perspective, he also knows that Romero is capable of bluffing here because it is the perfect card to bluff on. So it's like an added layer of confusion that that Jock has to sort of weed himself through. Yeah, I mean, Faraz doesn't eventually fold here, and I think it's probably a fine fold because you need Romero to be taking hands like 
a 10 and bluffing it or an under pair and bluffing it. And, you know, while I do think Romero is good enough to do that, because he realizes at this point, if his range is a lot of ace highs, which is make a straight, what are the worst hands in this range? It's going to be like random under pairs, right? And a lot of players just look at nines there and think, oh, showdown value, check, check. In which case, you should always fold when they bet because they're not going to be able to find very many bluffs because there's very few just like completely unpaired card hands at that point. But Romero is going to take the under pairs and just go all in with basically all of them. And that's why it's very important for Faraz to make sure he's checking some aces on the river. Because otherwise, when he checks the river, it's just all one pair hands, which are all or mostly going to fold to a river bet. And you're really, really unprotected. So it's very important there to check a lot on the river in Faraz's shoes. Right. Because Faraz probably doesn't have all that many bluffs either, right? It's just... and, and James has a lot of ace X. It's just going to call you, right? If you bluff, if you bet. So you got to be, that's the spot where you got to do some checking. All right, I got the King Jack again. Maybe I'll get to play this one. Ooh, maybe Jonathan Little will finally play a hand here on Run It Back. Everyone, thanks so much for chiming in. We've got, we have some good discussion going on in the chat. I do appreciate that. Um, if you guys have uh, any more questions, do send them in. Um, Jonathan has a lot of content on pokercoaching.com, so go check that out if it's uh, if it's basic entry-level questions. But if it's some fun fun stuff or specifics, well, maybe we should quiz him on what his favorite restaurants are in Las Vegas. Those That's always the fun stuff that I'm looking forward to hearing about. I have a fundamentals course. If you don't know how to play poker well, it's completely free. Check it out at pokercoaching.com slash fundamentals. It's about two and a half hours long it'll make you decent decent is sometimes all we can ask for and and uh to make and make ourselves feel good about playing some of these uh local tournaments now that live poker is slowly coming back and it's sometimes good to get a refresher uh, if you have not played for a long time um for you sure. are you are in the hand finally though that's good yeah so justin lent i raised with the king jack blind versus blind he called check check on this wait what's happening yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I thought, I thought the dealer was going. Check, check on 10, 7, 3. It's a pretty good flop for him. I don't really want to get check raised with my king jack. Turns a jack. So maybe we'll take all Justin's money. Now I'm just going to go for sizable value bet, I hope. We do go 65% pot. I could probably even go a little bit bigger. Justin obviously calls with his jack 8. He is super set up here. I just want a blank to come so I can win all the money. Six is pretty blank. Five, four is unlikely. But the problem is here is you actually have a lot of hands with a spade. It's like he could just have five of spades, four, right? Um, that said, I, I should probably go for value here, although it's close. This is one of these spots where you, like, you're looking for him to hero call you, right? Like, you need him to call with stuff like a 10, a 7. I go for 11,000 on the river, which is probably a little bit of an exploitative play, uh, because normally on the river, when you're in position, usually you either want to be going for a big bet or checking, yeah, yeah. But I thought Justin's range there was really weak, and I thought he might fold a seven, which I thought was the most likely hand to any decently big bet. But notice there that that cost me money, right? Getting fancy, trying to use the Phil Helmuth white magic cost me money here because if I just bet 30K, he would have called and I would have won 20K more. So that's a bummer. He, he almost author of multiple strategy books, it says. I wrote all these books back here. Do you believe that? I either wrote them all or had my hand in all of those. Wow. Wow. 15 of them are mine. How about that? 15 I books. must have nothing to do in my life. I mean, I feel as though poker has evolved so much that writing a book is just becoming harder and harder, right? It's, it's hard if you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> I, I, it's actually pretty, I, in, in terms of things that I do, it's not actually all that strenuous because I kind of know what it entails. I know I'm going to sit down. I'm going to grind it out for like two months. And by the time I'm done with them, I'm going to be really, really happy to be done with it and ready to go do something else. Right. Like go take all the money I'm going to make from that book and go play the U.S. Poker Open and um, try to turn it into a small fortune. So you're basically just parlaying, parlaying, parlaying. And yeah. That, that... I'm going to sit in this office for a few months, grinding, sweating, toiling away for all of you. And then I'm going to go parlay it. Uh, I, one question I'm curious about as we see Brad Owen only in here with the A7. Uh, against... So I raised... King Queen, he shoved for like 20 big blinds or 15 big blinds, something like that. I got to call King Queen. Right. So as we watch the showdown unfold here with Brad Owen, I'm curious, Jonathan, um, how much better are you as a player right now? All Lots of different people in the game, but how much better are you than when you had, you know, big seven figure uh, results? So this is an interesting question because I think proportionally back then I was better than most people. Right. Um, because a lot of people just weren't all that good back then. Right. Um, now I think the best players are like definitely better than me because they're devoting every single waking second of their life to poker and they're collaborating together, studying together, and they are devoting their life to the game. Whereas I'm devoting half my life to the game because I have a wife and two kids and I have a training site, right? So I'm devoting my time to other things. Um, that said, I think I'm 
learning poker about the best I possibly can, given my setup in life. Um, so like when I go play U.S. Poker Open, I expect to have a small edge, but not not a gigantic edge or anything. Whereas back in the day, I probably had like poker exploited the player field, the, the player pool, right? So like in my, in my first book, I wrote continuation bet a lot. Why? Because people fold too often. If you played the GTO strategy back then, you would have left a bunch of money on the table. I was talking to another poker coaching coach, uh, Jonathan Jaffe. We got heads up at one time um, in a WPT and I won. Ha ha. Got him. And he said, he told me like 10 years later, I went back and I watched this and I realized I was trying to play like closer to GTO and you were just running me over. Right. Like I presumed you would never be formatting all in with bluffs. Yet you format bluffed all in a lot. Right. So it was like, I was just maximally exploiting maybe just accidentally right. what he was doing. And Sometimes that just lines up perfectly where whatever your strategy is takes advantage of whatever your opponents are uh, susceptible to, right? But a lot of people have just gotten better. Everyone plays just a little bit closer to GTO than they did back in the day. And that's going to result in your edge going down. Meanwhile, you're in an interesting hand here against Faraz Jaka. Yeah, nice and set up. I know I'm not folding. I can tell you that. <laughs> you give me the top pair against Faraz Jaka, I would put all my money in. Luckily, he, he only wanted 12,000 of it. So that's good. <laughs> It's always good when they only want 12,000. Yeah, exactly. Um, what was the biggest thing you had to unlearn? As you know, solvers came into play, you started talking to all these brilliant minds. Were there glaring things that were pointed out in your game that you had to adjust? Yeah, um, out of position play, especially. I just used the continuation bet a lot, which to be fair, I don't think it's even necessarily all that bad against most people, but against good players, they are going to crush you if you continuation bet too often out of position. Especially when you're deep stack, there are a lot of spots where you're supposed to check 100% of the time out of position. Whenever you are, like say you raise middle position and the button calls, you have to check a ton. And uh, that's something that I definitely did not do at all up until just you know five or six years ago, whenever we started studying the solvers a lot. Also like shallow stacked play, um, really shallow stacked play. Like back in the day, people would just go all in or fold, right? Um, but even 12 big blinds deep, there are spots where you could be min raising and then folding to a shove or also having a shoving range, you now would min raise and then fold to a shove with some weak hands. Also, you defend the big blind a whole lot more now. And when you defend the big blind very shallow stack, sometimes you're leading all in, which is something I literally never did, even just three or four years ago. Like say someone if someone raises you defend the big blind, 15 big blinds deep, and it comes seven, six, four, you should be all in like half the time there. Just like open lead all in 2x pot. And that takes away the initial raiser's equity with stuff like random overcards, right? They just don't get to see the turn in the river. And that that's really good for you. So I mean, lots, lots of little things like this that you learn studying with the solver and, and going through it. I, so I, here we have a spot where Matt Affleck raises it up. Brad Owen three bets. Matt Affleck rips it all in. Um, this is aggressive. It's probably fine though. So given Brad had not been especially aggressive preflop, I think I would have flat called here because I think Brad's going to have a stronger range than normal when he three bets. Maybe that's just me being results oriented. I'm not sure. Like if I had to guess, he's probably not going to three bet quite as much as he should. Maybe like just a little bit less often. And if that's the case, you should in turn four bet bluff way less often. That said, if you think he's going to three bet with like ace queen offsuit and fold it to a shove, well, then you should shovel him with everything because he's going to fold too often, right? People talk about, am I a GTO player or a white magic player? I mean, in my mind, it's just like, what do the opponents do incorrectly? Recalibrate the solver, run it with the new adjusted range. And it gives you the answer, right? Like I just did here. If he's going to three bet ace queen offsuit and fold it to a shove, then obviously shove all in a ton because he's going to fold a lot, right? If he's going to three bet tighter and then call off adequately, you should shove less often. And that's what you got to try to figure out. Poker is a guessing game to that extent. So is the magical part of the game guessing what your opponent's going to do accurately more often than not? Maybe that's just it. Matt Affleck turns all the outs, literally all of them. I, mean, I don't know how many more cards are in the deck than this. And the funny thing is, is that Brad Owens, you know, you have to dodge half the deck basically at some point, uh, and he gets eliminated here in sixth place. Um, Brad Owen, the poker vlogger who has an awesome channel, uh, he is not a tournament grinder, and also he was on the wrong side of all these uh, cooler hands, and the fact that he made it this far is, is pretty laudable because he was definitely uh, getting hammered with the deck in the worst possible way. Um, so the only person he actually beat in the hand was me. He won a flip against me. So don't forget, I'm the only one he, he beat here, okay? <laughs> it's it's only fair that you were the one uh, taking a few hits off of him. Um, it's funny because he uh, river. We were all in pre-call, but he rivered me with the ace a minute ago. Whenever I I had the top pair and here, he had the best hand, but got rivered. But anyway, Brad Brad got torched here. It was unfortunate. 
<laughs> we're down to five players here on running back for people that are just tuning in we are watching this entire sit and go from Boker after dark until there is a winner so don't go anywhere stay uh, stick around and send in your questions to the chat don't forget to subscribe to the running back clips channel you can see it on the screen just look at the link in the description on our youtube page and find it there or just search for running back clips on youtube and subscribe to that page three clips a week all from our shows that I've done over the last year and a half. It's over 100 shows, so there's lots of things to choose from, and it's very exciting to dive back into some of the stories, like, for instance, Chris Moneymaker talking about uh, what, what he was thinking when the action was on him, and he did not know that it was on him back in the 03 main event, and then Johnny Chan reminded him that him, the action was on him. Very hilarious stuff. We have lots of great stuff on the show. By the way, I see Mitch in the chat. I see Jean Jeanette in the chat. I see lots of people that always watch the show. I see Curtis and Jamie and uh, Jerry and Nick. I love having everyone here in the chat. Don't forget, to, by the way, to like the video. Um, Noise Saw says, I already pre-ordered John's new book. Wow. Can people already do that? They can. They can go to dnbpoker.com. That's the publisher, dnbpoker.com. We have over a thousand people who have already pre-ordered it. I was told the other day. So wow. that's pretty cool. I haven't even talked about it really. It's the that's, first show I've talked about it on, I think. <laughs> that's amazing. Already a thousand pre-orders. Yeah. That is really, really good stuff. Uh, Love to Trade says, how much money did Brad win for going out in sixth place? This much, exactly this much, zero dollars. Well, he, he won zero and bought in for 5,000. So it's kind of like negative 5,000. Right, right. Um, but that money is gone as soon as you buy in, Jonathan. That's how it works. You, you, you definitely. It's gone. You're, you're stuck five thousand as soon as the first hand is dealt. Um, Especially in this table. Uh, winner take all. Uh, six hand of sit and go. So thirty k for the winner in this event. Um, but hey, you made the final table. Very, very true. Very true. He did make the final table. That is that is something that you can always talk about uh, if you if you play a sit and go like this. Um, big hand again. Uh, Jaka coming in for the race. And it is, um, why do I want to keep calling him Vincent? I have no clue. Justin. Justin. You must have known a Vincent who looked like him in yeah, school or something. Must Justin's be. really tall. When I first met him, he's like seven feet tall almost. And I'm short. I'm 5'7 or something like that. So I'm like, oh my gosh, you're a giant. I just, so is, is the structure relatively fast here on Poker After Dark? It's only fast because James Romero got a hold of all the chips. And then Matt Affleck got a hold of a lot of chips. So they had a lot of chips, maybe a hundred big blinds or something like that. And then the other three players, actually uh, Faraz and, and Justin were both pretty shallow and I was in the middle. So I just kind of blinded off. <laughs> I just sat there. <laughs> it's easy to take third place when you blind out. And then in this case, uh, Justin has the best of it with the nine against the seven. Chop it up. Chop, Chop it up. up. Ace on the river. Always funny to see that. Um, what else we got going on in the chat here? Um, Metal Mario says, do you think a large part of being a profitable player is choosing the right game? Yes. It's very important. Three things all you have to do to win at poker. Only three things. You have to find a game that you can beat. That can mean no limit hold'em. That can mean PLO. That can mean mixed games, whatever. It can mean tournaments, sit and goes, whatever. Find a game you can beat. May that also implies you are adequately skilled. To beat the players in the game you can beat, right? Don't just play the game you like. Play the game you are actually going to have an edge in. Then you have to play it a lot. You got to play that game a lot because usually in poker, your edges are not going to be gigantic. So, you know, if you're playing one, three, no limit, if you're really good, maybe you'll make 30 or $40 per hour, right? But if you show up and you do that 10 hours a day, you're talking three or 400 bucks a day. You do that each month, you're talking about, what is that? $9,000 a month playing one, three, no limit. Like it's... Real money, but you got to put in volume. You have to be willing to sit down and do the work. Most people don't want to do that. Then you also have to keep a proper bankroll. I have a article, the bankroll Bible at pokercoaching.com slash bankroll to make sure you stay reasonable with that. But that's really all you have to do. So you have to study enough to get better than your opponents in whatever game you're playing. Maybe if you're playing a tiny stakes against your friends when they're all having beers and chilling, then you know you probably don't have to be all that good yourself. First game I played, it was a $1 buy-in tournament. I didn't have to be all that good to win in the $1 buy-in tournaments, right? And as you move up in stakes, you play against better players, so you have to get more and more skilled. That's really all you have to do. Find, uh, find a game you can beat, play it a lot, keep a proper bankroll. The funny thing, But most people don't want to do all three of those things, and that's why most people do not succeed at poker. So the Because they thing, either want to play as, against the best players they possibly can or as high as they possibly can to the point that they lose their edge, uh, they don't want to play all that much. They want to go to the club or, or, and then they want to gamble. They want to play way too big. And that results in most people not making it. 
Well, what I was going to say is, as you were talking about the three things, I was on my on my fingers counting which how, how much I qualify for, and I, and I ended up with this, just one. Good, you're almost there. Yeah, I only need two more. I only need bankroll management, and I need to put in the hours. Uh, so, um, you know, we're almost there. We're getting there. Uh, South Point Nightly. That's my jam. I can beat those players. I don't play it enough. People are terrible. It's really fun. Uh, but yeah, don't not putting in the volume and no bankroll management. So there you go. You guys in the chat, let me know how many of those three that Jonathan just <laughs> named do you qualify for? Oh, if any. Zero, one, two, or three. Let us know in the chat. If you stick by Jonathan's principles to be a winning player, how many things do you qualify for? I think most people will say one. One of those three. I think that's I think thing. most people don't keep a proper bankroll. Most people do not play nearly often enough. I mean, you mentioned the the nightly. That's only one tournament. If you played that every single day, that's only 360 tournaments a year. Yep. Not a lot. Right? So you got to play a lot of like small stakes live tournaments to get an adequate volume because they're kind of fast structured and there's a lot of variance, right? And the rake's high. That cuts into your edge. Do most people play in games they can beat? Eh, no, probably not. So I think I think the right answer for most people is zero. Zero. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, we got we got. Craig says one. Jackson says two. Wow, you're really making it if you, if you say two. That's that's awesome. If you do two, you're probably winning. <laughs> yeah, you pro you probably it's are. It's close. Winning. It's close. You just need to have a little bit more discipline. What's the worst of the three to not hit? If you if you if you say two, what's the worst possible spot? It's well, so if you. Well, so, okay, if you have an edge, that's just fine. Like, you're going to be profitable. You're just not going to make all that much money because you're not putting in volume. Right. Right? Um, I guess it depends on what you're trying to accomplish, right? right. Like, right. if you don't keep proper bankroll, but you don't play all that often, but you have a big edge when you play, you're like, it's like you're going to the casino with an edge, but you play once every month or whatever. So, like, you're not going to win a bunch of money just because you're not playing, but you're also not going to lose on average. So, that's probably what you want. You want to make sure you have an edge. Having an edge is very, very important. And um, among the other, I mean, that's the number one thing. Well, right? Jonathan, let me tell you this. The funniest, of course, would be great bankroll management, great table selection, but you can't beat the games. Yeah, yeah. You, you play a lot. <laughs> you have infinite bankroll, yep. but you just always play with better players. Exactly. Then you lose. Then okay, you so lose. right. That, that's the worst combination for sure. <laughs> oh, man. And of course, the most boring option to be good at is bankroll management. Who likes bankroll management? <laughs> when I play, I just want to play and, and get it in there. Well, a lot of people want to gamble, right? They play poker because they want to gamble. They want to feel excited. I do not want to feel excited when I play. I want to be nice and chill and calm. That way I can think clearly. Wow, Jonathan, come on. What a, what a boring I know answer. it's boring, right? So boring. The thing is, is um, you know, winning at poker consistently, long term, it's kind, kind of like a job. That's why one of us has a row of books behind him that he's written. And one yeah, of us I has a, a job. One of them has a book, has a row of books behind him that he's never read. So that's yeah. the, the difference between <laughs> us. Um, Jeanette says two. Robert says zero. Uh, Jeanette says she's bad and she hit two. So maybe she qualifies for what we just said. Infinite bankroll. Lots of time putting in that hours, but just finding herself at the wrong tables. Um, so the neat thing about that player type is that if you just move down in stakes a little bit, you'd probably be winning. Right. Because usually people play like right at the limit to where they're kind of around break even. Because if you lose a ton, you'll just quit, right? Because that's no fun. And if you win a ton, well, then you obviously have an edge. So you're, if you were to just play slightly smaller games or just study some, that would probably make you a winner pretty close to immediately. Uh, the question is, do you want to do that? A lot of people like to feel that gambler. They get it in their head. I'm a 2-5 player. I would never move down to 1-3 or whatever, right? Or I'm a $500 tournament player. I'm not going to go play the 200. If you play the 200, you get to win and make substantial money. Play the 500, you get to go broke. You get to pick. Mitch has a comment, a comment of the day so far. Mitch says, I haven't lost at live poker even once since March of 2020. Nice. Mitch? I played it twice and lost twice. <laughs> uh, we got Affleck. You're here watching one of them here today. With the raise. He has got jacks. All right. Affleck raises it up. I had, I think, like 19 big blinds here. And it, it's a shove. It's an annoying spot where we, when you shove it all into the ace nine and get called, you just lose a lot like this time. <laughs> but Affleck's going to fold a decent amount. And so I've lost every hand so far. Uh, can we win this one? I did win one small pot. I won one small pot today against Justin Saliba where I had top pair against top pair. So I left 20,000 in chips on the table. Well, Now I get it in horribly. At least you made it to, to the top five. I made it to the top five and I made the final table. So exactly, that's pretty good. Uh, not a great flop. Do see no, some uh, back, I got a spade. backdoor potential. Yeah, 17%. I'd sign for 17%. Uh, 17 is a lot against a good player like Matt Affleck. 
Yeah, I mean, not, now now we're now we're looking at a nice little sweat cart there. I have all the outs. Exactly. Too did, did they know that I put on this event? I'm supposed to last a little bit, right? Like this this was my the game that I organized. You're you're the celebrity that has to stay in for for the cameras. Yeah. Notice in this game that I, I found a game I could beat. Actually, I, I didn't find a game I could beat. I have a proper bankroll, and uh, I'm gonna I'll play a lot, but I am playing against all good players. Um, I, I'm, I'm curious, <laughs> bad game selection for me. I'm, I'm curious if we're gonna hear a little interview with you at the end here. Idea. To bust out your boss, but ten, ten times, such as right poker. Spin it up. Ten times. Do it. Bye. Oh, you, oh, you're you're dejected. You're so dejected. You just walk right off stage. I love it. I love the I love the passion for the game and just walking out instantaneously. I, I have this problem where after I lose, I don't especially want to do anything besides leave. <laughs> um, maybe that's a bit of a leak. No, it it just goes to show how much you care, which which is awesome. Um, Some people like to go there and hang out and chill after they lose. I want to go. <laughs> But do you I don't know why I feel that way. I'm just telling you how I feel. I'm not, I'm sure there's something like really wrong in my psyche that makes me feel this way. <laughs> but, but uh that's how I feel. But do you want to go and play again to wash away the taste, or do you want to go to your room and order room service? No, I don't want to go play again. No, for sure. No, <laughs> I, I want to go, I want to go away. I want to go away from poker for a little bit. <laughs> Some people go and play again. I really don't get those people. Uh, good question here coming in from Love to Trade. It's actually not a question, it's a statement, but I see it as a question. He says, my stocks in the market swing six figures up and down, yet I am too nervous to play 2-5. Jonathan, gi gi give our friend some advice. Maybe it's smart, to be fair. Uh, there's a lot of value in putting something that you know, putting money in something that you presume is going to go up long term, like stocks. You know, you just put it in there, you kind of forget about it. You're, but he apparently doesn't because he's sweating it out, seeing so swings each day. But... um. This, this happens with a lot of people, and I think it's probably fine because, like, you have some liquid money you don't really want to lose, and then you have illiquid money, illiquidish money. I realize stocks aren't all that liquid, but you have illiquid money that you can't touch at all. Like, a good example is I have some angel investments that I know that money is just locked up for, like, seven years, and maybe I win, maybe I lose, but I have no clue what is up and down on any individual, in any individual day or each month or each year, really, right? right? And it's kind of nice to just... I trust you to do good work, do your good work, bring me back money. <laughs> and um, stocks are kind of like that. And, and I guess you've been taught that you're making good decisions there. Whereas in poker, maybe you're not so sure you have an edge. And you, as a presumably hardworking person, don't want to play in a game and give away your hard-earned money where you may or may not have an edge, right? right? So maybe you feel a little bit bad about it because maybe you're not sure that you are making profitable decisions. Justin lost. Yeah, Justin is out. Affleck has Queen A here. Um, <laughs> All right, so now we are down to Affleck and Romero, who have a bunch of chips, and Faraz is relatively shallow. So they're playing heads up with the spectator, who happens to have some chips left. Uh, yeah, a few, a few chips left. <laughs> Never count out Faraz. Faraz will come back and take all your money. You got to watch out for him. Uh, but no, no real ICM implications because it is winner take all, which makes it a little mm, bit, a li little bit easier for uh, Affleck and, and Romero to uh, to play more aggressive. Well, if anything, it makes Faraz more willing to play aggressive. Imagine they paid two people here. Yeah, but Faraz is already Faraz would then he's already be kind of incentivized to just hope the other two run into each other. Uh, yeah, I guess. Which but... they're not going to all that often, but sometimes they will. Right. Right. But wouldn't, um, wouldn't it depends on how short Faraz is actually. Faraz is like really short, and it doesn't really matter all that much. Right. But if Faraz is like medium, and like right here, I don't think he has no chips. I think he has like 100,000 chips to starting sack or something like that. So it's not like he has no chips. Um, yeah, ICM is tough. We're not talking about that today. It's winner take all. Get in there and gamble. Exactly. The, the, the way poker should be. There should be more winner take all tournaments. That would be a lot of fun to watch. You know, like a, like a 1K event with 100 players, winner take all? Let's do it. It'd be so much fun. Um, Why not? And then, of course, there's there's the sixty dollar nightly tournament at South Point that gets chopped ten ways as soon as we get down to ten, um, which is is a funny little contrasting thing here. Um, so here, blind versus blind, Affleck, I think limps, Frost checks, flop comes ace six four, Affleck with his GTO brain checks, Jaka bets with his pair, which is fine, and Affleck calls with the queen high, something a lot of people don't do, but it is almost certainly right because he has a lot of backdoor draws and queen high is often good here. Binks the queen on the turn. Can he go for value? Probably not. I wouldn't go for value. Very easy to be against 
a six in this scenario. Although maybe you get called by a four. The thing is, is Affleck probably, I'm sorry, uh, Jocker probably doesn't have a whole lot of aces because he raised a lot of those pre-flop. It's hard to get called by four here. I'll just always check. Let's see if super GTO genius goes for the value bet. No. Okay, good. I just, I, I always like watching content like this because it's almost like I know what I would do here. And it's like I pause the video on my brain and say, I commit to an answer, right? And then does a good player make that play? And right. if, if they do what I did, I, I assume. Pausing the action and watching PokerGo content is a very good way to do it. You just have to know who the players are that you want to learn from. So watching the high stakes is probably the right way to do it. But then, of course, watching high stakes cash games is so much more complex because of all the intricacies uh, between the players and, and the stack sizes being so deep. So I think tournaments are easier to learn from watching uh, at the highest level than cash games are. Because I will say that cash games often run because there are a few players there who are not especially great because how else are they all going to put up a hundred thousand dollars or whatever right and therefore if you have one player at the table who is perhaps not all that great then everybody is trying to get after that player to some extent which is going to result in some very odd play every once in a while which is why you sometimes see very loose splashy cash game play compared to tournament play despite the fact that it's much deeper stacked um because very often they are trying to play with one particular player so you have to make sure you know who's good and you have to make sure you know why they are getting so incredibly out of line sometimes and not other times, right? Exactly. But if you watch a lot of the high stakes tournaments on Poker Go, it's almost entirely very good players and you just like kind of pick a player and, and what they do is usually either the best option or the second best option, right? And my site, pokercoaching.com, we actually have 1200 interactive quizzes where we put you in every, in someone's uh, shoes every single betting round and ask, what would you do? You have to commit to an answer, you get a score, and then you get feedback. All these coaches here make a bunch of these quizzes and they're all available on the site. So you can essentially go and play with them at the table and, and get feedback in real time. Uh, Jerry Garcia on YouTube says, it depends how many drunk tourists are in the game. And that's, his, that's what his win rate is dependent on. You and me both, Jerry, you and me both. That is probably the case for, uh, for, most, of, uh, for most of us uh, here. Um, Noise Sauce asked, how much does John use live reads these days? John, do you still have it? Do you still have the, the finesse? I think um, in the small stakes games and medium stakes games, uh, I think you can very often pick up reads. Like sometimes you can just look and tell the player's bluffing, right? Um, I think most people probably focus on tells a little bit too much. They just want to think I can just look and tell every time, but you can't look and tell every time. You can look and tell against blatant tell boxes, I don't know, like 10% of the time. You know, like not a lot, but some, some, enough to where you should pay attention to it. But I would definitely recommend everyone just learn to play good poker before they decide to become the next Phil Helmuth where he can just look and tell their, the opponent's bluffing and make the right play more often than not. But that is a very good point. Speaking of Phil Helmuth, a uh, high-stakes duel, of course, is still ongoing between Negrano and Helmuth. Uh, next match is coming real soon. Um, I believe June 14th, off the top of my head, we're going to have another match between uh, Helmuth and Negrano. They're playing for 400k this time around, which is really bizarre when you think about it. That is a lot of money, and obviously um, we, we want to see Negrano win, and I'm being very biased because that would mean that the show continues into the next round, whether Helmuth you know, challenges him or whether he gets a new opponent, which would be Tom Dwan. Spoiler alert, we already confirmed that, um, which will be an 800K match. So that that is going to be terrific. It's going to be so much fun to watch. Uh, whatever happens in um, the upcoming episode of High Stakes Duel, uh, it's going to be massive. So you guys check that out. It's going to be on PokerGo exclusively. Um, and while you're at it, check out all the other content that we have, all the old school action of the WSOP. Jonathan, I know you'll probably get a kick out of this as well. We have... Uh, 13 main event episodes from before 2003 that we added to the archives, including 73, 81, Stu Unger, 97, out on Fremont Street. All that stuff is available now. Um, just a really cool uh, time machine uh, travel if you want to go dive into the archives. It's nice and retro. Yeah. A uh, qu question from Mike Washington. I've seen a question before, so I'll ask it right now because I missed it earlier. He says, Jonathan, what is the best way to use HEM? I'm assuming that's Hold'em Manager. Uh, stats to improve your game. Are there certain stats we want to focus on more? <laughs> Moreover, can we infer anything from MTT BB per 100? I don't know about MTT BB per 100. I would recommend you go to pokercoaching.com slash HUD, H-U-D. We have... My heads up display there. I show you exactly what I use, exactly how I use it. And that'll answer that question. But I mean, I don't think you need to go super duper in depth because unless you're playing against the same players on a regular basis, you're just not gonna have that big of a sample on anyone. Um, so I would generally just recommend you 
get, you know, eight, six or eight good stats, like preflop raise, three bet, steal, full big blind to steal, stuff like that. Um, I've had very good success just keeping it simple, making it implementable. What you see some people do is they end up getting like a hundred stats on their screen <laughs> and then they just can't find what they need or they have all this, it's just like clutter, right? right? So I would try to tell you to find things that you found to be very useful and go with that. Um, that said, uh, pokercoaching.com slash HUD, you can get the heads up display settings that I use and I make a video explaining how I do it. Right. Uh, Shin, Shin, 67 on Twitch says, Pokergo, is it possible to download your content as a subscriber so I can watch offline? Sorry, that is not available yet, but I believe it's on the list. We have, we have a lot of improvements that we are making every day to the app. So once that becomes available, I'll announce it, uh, here on the show. Um, meanwhile, we got some more action here as it's still three-way. It is shallow stacked all in again from Faraz Jaka. This is a spot where I think King Tensuda just has to call. Maybe if there were no payout implications, it could it'd be close. But even then, it's just almost always a call. King Ten suit is great. These big suited high card hands have pretty good equity. So you just can't look to fold this, even for 15, 20 big blinds. Is when it, you're buttoned against small blind, right? Because small blind should be quite loose. Is it very different uh, if, if Affleck's hand is off suit? Yeah, it is. It is a lot different. Because in this scenario, instead of having 62% equity, in a good case, you'd have 58% equity, which is a little bit less. And in the bad cases, you also have less, right? Right. So you would be more inclined to fold the offsuit hand. If you raise this one, I, it's still probably just a call, but it's close. But like king nine offsuit would be a fold, right? I think. Whereas king 10 suited, I think is, sorry, king king 10 offsuit is probably a call. King nine offsuit is probably a fold. And do you- Depending on the exact stacks, I'm not sure exactly what they are. Do you know this- because you're memorizing or are you just sort of going through it in your head of like what you know is right? Because for people that are watching this, they might be thinking like, how does he remember all this stuff? If you look at the charts enough, you just start to know. So I have this program on my phone. It's called the Poker Coaching App, okay? We have GTO preflop charts. I'm gonna pull it up. I'm gonna pull up the exact spot, okay? Okay, love, blinds, love it. Re button versus raise. You can also use this on your computer. I'm sorry, no, button versus three bet all in from small blind. hands in blue and the hands in gray are not in your range. So GTO here, perfect GTO strategy, folds King 10 off suit barely. So I was slightly off. King nine's definitely a fold. King nine suited, barely a fold, but also on the cusp. Against Faraz Jaka though, I'd be calling because he's crazy. Um, King 10 suited though, definitely a call. King Jack off suit, definitely a call. And this is just like a few inputs. You input it here, it tells you the right answer. And and what- And, and as, if we're shallower stack like 15 big lines, um, you're going to see that you're going to call off a little bit wider. And um, so, yeah, actually funny, it, whatever. Yeah. So that, that's what you would do in that scenario. Right. But they that, have all those charts for all different stack depths, all the way up to 200 big blinds. That's discussing right. like when you get six bet and stuff, right? That is very now, Obviously, most look. people do not play GTO poker. Most people play slightly off one way or the other. And you're, you're going to have to use a little bit of logic to adjust accordingly. But I mean, yeah, I'm essentially guessing, but I'm guessing because I've looked at that thing many, many, many thousands of times. And the thing is, if like you just reference it over and over, you'll eventually just know it. Like flashcards, right? And, and the great thing about the app is that you can use it at the table, not while you're in the hand, but let's say you know you're playing three-handed. You already know what hands you're going to raise because perhaps you have that memorized 50-ish percent of hands, whatever it is. You go ahead and think ahead of time, what's likely to happen here? Mm -hmm. But probably small blind Frost Jock is going to rip it all in on me. So pull up that chart, look at it before the dealer shuffles their cards, Put your phone down, look at your hand, play your hand accordingly. And it's and, and then after you make your play, get out the chart, make sure you played it right. It's like you're quizzing yourself, you're improving your skills, right? I mean, my All right, heads up between the two super crushers here. Matt Affleck has the nuts. Top pair, no kicker. I actually analyzed a bunch of the hands from um Doug Polk versus Daniel Negreanu and Daniel Negreanu against Phil Hamath on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash poker coach. And we've gone through a bunch of them, probably like 50 or 60 of these heads up hands. Sometimes showing the GTO strategy, that was more when Negreanu was playing against Polk compared to when he's playing against Helmuth because then GTO goes out the window to, uh, to some extent. But check it out if you like heads up strategy. I've learned a lot in the process of making that because I have not played a ton of like deep stacked heads up poker. Most of my heads up experience and practice has been from like online heads up sit and goes and in late late tournament stages of the tournaments so it was good to go through there and learn how to play deep stacked heads up no limit holding to some extent 
For people that are just tuning in, we are watching Heads Up between Matt Affleck and James Romero. They're playing for $30,000, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, no, this action is not live, but we are live. So if you have any questions, do send them in. We are on Twitch, on Facebook, and on YouTube. Don't forget to like, follow, subscribe, do all that good stuff. And check out my brand new channel, Running Back Clips. Search for it on YouTube or click on the link in the description if you are watching on YouTube already as we speak. Uh, three clips a week going out on that channel. It's going to be highlights from my Running Back shows uh, in which I have featured Greg Raymer, Chris Moneymaker, uh, Joe Hashem, Lex Veldhaus, S uh, Scott Seaver. Um, we've had Ben CB on the show to break down some high stakes action. Uh, so we have tons of cool guests on the show, uh, including some of the clips from this show that we'll be putting on the channel as well. So uh, really cool stuff for you guys to dive into. If you are a big poker fan, you should definitely go and check it out. Um, in this format, uh, Jonathan, if you see James against Matt, who would you give the edge in heads up play? Is one of these guys uh, more proficient in that? I am just always going to presume Romero is better than basically everybody. <laughs> I think Matt is great. I watch all of his content. I devour it all. I think he is a world-class player, world-class teacher. I think Romero may be the best. Right. So There you go. Sorry. I, I would have picked him over anybody. So basically, uh, Romero with the slight edge. But of course, we're not going to realize a uh, big sample size here. So it's going to be uh, interesting to see how this plays out uh, for those. Also, Affleck has more chips. So... Affleck has the edge, percent fifty three percent. So I, I don't think either player has any sort of gigantic edge in this spot, because like, look, both players are very, 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 very strong, incredibly strong, incredibly studied. I'm sure they've studied all these scenarios. Funny enough, if I if I did not know the work that Affleck has put in away from the table, I would have just said like Romero by a mile, because I know how good Romero is. But I've seen all of Affleck's content at PokerCoaching.com and how much effort he puts into studying and really finding the answers to all these scenarios that for all I know, he could have an edge here. I wouldn't doubt it. I mean, he very easily could be more studied than Romero is in this scenario. All right. So we are heads up indeed. Um, heads up, definitely something that most of us humans uh, that are mortal don't get to play a whole lot in a live scene. Uh, so it's, it's very tough to really be ready for unless you practice this a lot uh, online. Uh, what are some what are some basic tips that we should keep in mind for that one time that we get heads up in our nightly events uh, here locally in Las Vegas? Well, you already nailed it. Get some practice online ahead of time or get some practice with your friends or your significant others, right? I mean, all it takes is you and one other person. You probably have at least one other person in your life that you can find it somewhere at some point to play heads up, no limit, hold them with you. Practice playing where you start with something like 10 big blinds and 15 big blinds and 20 big blinds, all the way up to like 40 or something like that. You don't need to get good at playing 100 big blind heads up because it basically never comes up. So get some experience. Get some experience is number one. Next, um, realize that hand values don't really change, but ranges just get substantially wider to the point that stuff like middle pair is really, really good. Um, not that you should be blasting it in or anything, but you have to realize you're trying to not fold hands that have pretty good equity and middle pair is, is usually quite good. Whereas at a nine handed table in a six way pot, middle pair is just absolute garbage. Right. So that's really, it ranges are just substantially wider and that's going to result in you needing to try to not fold out reasonable holdings. That said, a lot of time when you get heads up, you can find yourself against players who just fold way too often. If that's the case, just raise a lot continuation that small a lot. If they just call, keep blasting them. If they raise you at any point, get out of the way. But this is just like advice for how to play against generally cautious players in general. Um, but I think a lot of players do not fully adequately adjust to playing heads up. Therefore, they do end up being just like a little bit too tight. Right. It's intimidating, though. It's intimidating to play against the same person hand after hand and to get into spots where you have to play a lot of flops and turns. And especially in tournament play, up until you get heads up, you're not really forced into those situations all too often because you can always sort of watch the other people play if you are playing a conservative style. Well, take a look at this hand right here, right? Here we have Affleck on the button with the 8-5 suited. He just got check min raised on the flop by Romero's queen five offsuit. Stone air ball. Going back to those draws you want to use, right? You want to use the draws that have relatively low equity to check raise, plus some nuts, plus some premium draws. And uh, I mean, queen five is an optimistic one. <laughs> but like, sure, right? If you get a queen, it's probably good. You get a five, it's probably good. Maybe not the five. Queen for sure. And no, no, notice now, Romero just check raised the flop with the queen five, and then he blasted all in for pot size bet on the turn. Strong, strong, right? That's the spot that I would probably have not not taken. And Romero just gets in there and gets it done. 
And uh, that's how he operates. Maybe he had a live read. Maybe he just knows it's GTO. I don't know. He's a wizard. Huh. So is that because of the turn gives him a gut shot that's enough for him to go all in? Or is this more dependent on how he perceives Affleck's range? He probably just thinks he needs to have a few bluffs. <laughs> this is one of them. It's so bizarre to to fully comprehend these things. You know, the thing it, is, I mean, if you look at the solvers very often, it's like, yeah, you need to have 5% bluffs with these hands. Right. If you think your opponent folds a little bit too much, maybe you need to bluff like 20% of the time with those hands. If you think they call too much, maybe you bluff none with those hands. Um, but the best players, they are like trying to mix it up to some extent, and they just go for it. Maybe he had a live read that he thought Affleck was a little bit weak. Who knows? I don't know what Romero's thinking. You got to get him on here. Send him these clips and uh, have Romero tell you what's going on. You t you tell you convince Romero to come on the show, and I'll I'll do a breakdown session with him. That'd be a lot of fun, and then uh, maybe we can find some other content of of his where he's involved because I, I know he's played more high rollers in the past that we can get him to uh, to analyze because it would be great to have uh, to to give some shine to some of these newer faces and voices that most people you know they're like oh James Romero who's this guy um, only because you are telling us now that he is you know very very good most people are going to learn about him so it would be cool to put him into the spotlight a bit more. Well, so everyone who plays high stakes poker knows him. Like he's, he's actually more of like an OG to some extent, right? Like you said, he well, had the first big tournament score in 2016, five years ago, right? But um, before Poker Go, there really just like wasn't a ton of televised poker happening anymore. Right. And that resulted in, and even if there, it was televised, it was like very specific tournaments, right? Like James has been traveling the party poker circuit and whatnot. And those those are not on Poker Go and they're not on TV, right? Yet there is playing $25,000 buying tournaments winning them, right? And that kind of thing is just not in the mainstream, right? And that's the tough thing is there are a lot of world-class players who a lot of, especially like Americans, just don't know because you're not really seeing that footage. You're not playing those tournament series. And that results in you being kind of out of the loop. Very true. And it's my job to make sure all my students and myself stay in the loop. <laughs> Uh, happy dude on YouTube says, I thought poker after dark was a cash game. Could I be confusing it with high stakes poker? Uh, no, sir. Uh, you are both, you're correct. Also, uh, poker after dark in its new iteration, season 12 has been mostly a cash game, but in the past, the first seven seasons, it was mostly sit and goes. It was mostly 20 K winner take all sit and goes produced for TV. They aired very late, late at night on NBC. And of course, after season seven, which was the black Friday year, there was a 10 year hiatus of no poker after dark. And then poker go brought it back with the return of Tom Dwan, which is a crazy cash game, which happened in 2017. And ever since, we've been putting out season after season after season of mostly cash games. And every now and then, we mix in a sit and go for all time's sake, which is always a lot of fun to watch. And high stakes poker, yes, that is always a cash game. Similar thing after Black Friday, 10 year hiatus, and we brought it back. And high stakes poker now is a new season out on Poker Go. So definitely don't miss that. Go check it out if you've never seen it before. And we have tons of clips on our YouTube and Facebook channels from the new seasons of both shows. So if you just want to get a taste first, check it out there on our channels uh, to, to know what's up. And then I promise you, you'll be convinced to subscribe to uh, Poker Go because there's just an infinite amount of cool shit to watch, if I can say so myself. If you like poker and you like poker content, you should sign up to the main site that makes the poker content which is poker go and it's not even expensive it's relatively cheap so here here we have romero on the river again did he get showdown value with the jack nah he doesn't think so he's just gonna put them all in <laughs> maybe not all in but a sizable bet another miserable spot right where affleck just has this kind of well last hand he had, he had nothing but here he has a bluff catcher but everything got there right and here we see romero taking another hand that's effectively the bottom of his range and bluffing it that a lot of people do not bluff because here you are going to be able to get a king or a queen to fold some portion of the time got the queen to fold right after watching james romero all i want to go do is go play live poker and put people all in <laughs> yeah me too I think it gets you pumped up right it's like i just want to go blast them <laughs> it's true like i'm watching this and i'm thinking like i'm gonna be all in every time when i get back to live poker um but timing timing and and and, and science are, are sort of important as well uh, well against players like romero who will bluff a decent amount you just need to really make sure you're protecting your checking range and perhaps even over calling whenever they bet like so say you know you're supposed to call i don't know say 70 percent of the time maybe call like 85 percent of the time or something or every time i mean to me a lot of people get flustered when you talk about having them pay for content because they think everything should be free in today's day and age we got to realize this show alone costs a ton of money to produce right i presume somebody's paying you to sit there nobody's paying me but like <laughs> 
this stuff costs money. We got We got to get some income somehow. On my training site, pokercoaching.com, we spend about $40,000 a month on content paying the coaches. And that's just like me paying people to work from their own home. Who knows how much it costs to put on this Poker Go content? Because like, you have a studio. I don't have a studio. I have a little, little office, right? And it's expensive. And so you want to recoup some or all of that in the ideal world, which is why pokercoaching.com has a lot of free stuff. Like this is free on Poker Go. Well, free here on YouTube, right? But then there's also some paid content. And if you like it, you appreciate this content i would i would hope that you would support the people making the content exactly and you know i get jonathan on my show to let the people know about what he's doing etc etc you scratch my back i scratch yours that's sort of how this goes and of course the people in the studio that you guys don't see all the camera operators and producers and lights and makeup and audio and video all those there's like 15 people at the show that aren't playing in the game (laughs) Yeah, exactly. They make the final table every time. You just never get to see them. Um, yeah. And and that's really cool for you to also say that, Jonathan, and, and to uh, show support because, yeah, it, it does take a lot to get all this stuff uh, going and moving and, and you know, bringing live, live tournaments back. It's been such a giant operation in this strange pandemic year to bring live poker back. And, of course, there was lots of precautions being taken to tape these shows. And now we're getting to a stage where we can do live tournaments again, which is super exciting. And those uh, start, by the way, next week on Friday, the US Poker Open. Don't miss that. We're going to have tons of free streaming on YouTube and Facebook, I believe. And then we're going to have um, uh, lots of exciting live reporting coverage as well uh, for those that just want to sweat the updates. And meanwhile, we just uh, we just missed the giant all in here at the end. We're just going to go scroll back here. We had Ace King all in against Ace 10. Um, yeah, this is just a setup spot. Whenever you get down to like 20, 30 big blinds or so, so and both players get a decently strong hand, the money's just going to go in. Nothing Affleck could have done here. Let's look, watch Matt Affleck. He's about to lose $30,000 out of his pocket. He, does he look happy to you? <laughs> look at Romero. He just won $30,000. He look happy to you? He looks thrilled. <laughs> this is- so in my video blog, again, check it out on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash poker coaching. Uh, we went to uh, a little bar afterwards and Romero strolls in late because uh, you know he just won all the money. I'd been sitting there for quite a while because I lost a long time ago. And... I, I didn't know which one of these guys won. So I come in and I asked, did you win? I was like, yeah. <laughs> like, I said I was going to win. He said he'd been preparing for the last few months. He actually said that he didn't realize his exact plans whenever we went to schedule this tournament. So he actually flew from Brazil to America to play this and like back to Mexico. So he's going to have to be on the plane for like 40 hours. So if he's going to be on the plane 40 hours, he better win the tournament, make it worth his time. And, and, he, and he did. And he did. And it was a very entertaining show. Uh, Jonathan, you were involved in uh, a cash game as well. Uh, tee that up for the people that are interested in watching that as well. That is on Poker Go. I don't remember the exact name of the show, but it was a twenty-five fifty cash game where you buy in for $20,000. You can buy in one additional time if you go broke, but the blinds go up every, I don't know, two hours or something like that. And uh, that was a wild game. We got to get in there. We got to gamble. It was a lot of fun. Make sure you check it out on Poker Go, Poker After Dark. There you go. Uh, Jonathan, you have a new book coming out once more for the people at home that are paying attention. Um, They can pre-order it, right? That's already available? They can pre-order it at dandbpoker.com. That is Secrets of Professional Tournament Poker. I would like everyone to go to pokercoaching.com slash free, though, and get a completely free membership. Try out the site. It's completely free. If you sign up and pay me money and you do not like it, let me know within 30 days. I'll give you all your money back. Because if I don't help you get better at poker, I do not want or deserve your money. So get in there, learn, improve your skills, and crush your opponents. Very, very strong. I appreciate that. For everybody still watching, please like, subscribe, do all that good stuff. I'll be back next week with another show. Uh, Tons of great guests lined up. Um, I'm going to have Timothy Adams on the show soon. Uh, We're going to bring some celebrities on the show to uh, watch some poker action with. Um, And if if my life goes the way that I want it to go, I am still queued up to have Jamie Gold and Patrick Antonius on the show to watch some old school WSB final tables and, of course, some high stakes poker action. Antonius versus Sammy Farha, still one of my all-time favorite hands in the history of televised poker. When 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 they say, "Are you flushing? Are you flushing?" <laughs> um, just an incredible hand, Jack Nine against King Queen. All right, everyone at home, thanks so much for watching. I really appreciate it. This was Run It Back. Go follow Jonathan. You can see his Twitter handle on screen. He'll post all the updates there about his new book and the content. And of course, he's coming out for U.S. Poker Open, which means that we will have some live tournament action to sweat. For now. My name is Ram Karinkama. Give me a follow as well. If you have any suggestions for guests, please send those in. And then until next week when I'll be back with a new show. So thanks for watching. Catch you guys next week.